Thank you, Jesse. Um, not one drop. Um, bring in, uh, this is my, uh, my personal story framed on my girlfriend, Lyndon. So it's two commercial fishing women. Um, and her god, her children, I always call them my godchildren because I didn't have kids. <laughs> her children were two and four at the time of the oil spill. And so it's, it's 20 years of those kids growing up and me trying to explain what, you know, why I'm involved in this now, why I'm involved in that now. Um, I mean, those kids grew up, a whole generation, under the shadow of this oil spill. And then being told they couldn't go to the colleges they wanted to go to because no settlements in court, no money. I mean, that's the kind of trauma. So, um, uh, and then we've had another group that worked with the scientists because the scientists said, oh, well, okay, wait, I got I to get this. Let me, let me share this story with you. Okay, so now does, this is a big exercise in common sense, okay? You're gonna hear stuff that is not gonna make sense. If it doesn't make sense, don't believe it. Even if it's a PhD scientist telling you that. I have never seen so many PhD scientists sell out to Exxon. There were contracts down the whole West Coast, which included the University of Washington, which is how I know about this, because my major professor sent me a contract. $250,000 blanket contract to come work for Exxon. $250,000, didn't bird scientists, fish scientists, marine mammal scientists, and all that Exxon tried to do was minimize the damages to the environment so that it wouldn't have to pay you all less money. And you know what, they had a, they're rich enough, and so is BP, to have a whole parallel set of science compared to what the federal government and the state are hopefully gonna do. So, um, I did not take one of those contracts, and this is how uh, this is how I got into the situation because I was working with Cordova District Fishermen United. And all, I'm on their board, also well I was, and then with United Fishermen of Alaska, I was on their board. And the fisherman said, you know, here's all these PhDs parading in front of the camera, telling the media, telling the rest of America how it's all going to recover fast. Don't worry, you know. And I'm it on the other side. Because there's gag orders. I already know there's gag orders on your Florida people because I've tried. People have said you've got to talk to the Florida EPA. The, that's not what it's called, but the Florida Fish and whatever. And uh, I've gotten emails back. You can't. They're gag. I could go. I could talk. They could listen. They're not violating the gag order then. You know. So, but I mean, so you don't. You're going to lose your spokesperson. You you got to fight a PhD with a PhD. Unfortunately, at that level, but uh, at the level of the media and stuff. But. Um, so the fisherman just dragged me out and said, you're it. You know, you're, our, you're it for us. It's like, whoa, I didn't get trained for this in school. But um, so here's the story with the fisherman and the long-term harm. Because I think you're going to be in for the same kind of stuff here in the bigger Gulf. Um, scientists all came in and said, uh, oil's not going to cause that much harm. It won't cause long-term harm. And the fisherman said, hmm. You know, that doesn't make sense to us because our pink salmon spawn on the beaches that got oil. Our herring spawn on our two primary, we're not like you guys where you have 15,000 species, okay? We had two primary, uh, I mean, yeah, we have cod and other stuff, but I mean two, salmon, pink salmon, and, her and herring, our primary economic states. We fish the other four species of salmon as well. But the point is those two species spawn on the beaches. And the fisherman said, how could there be this much oil on the beaches? And how, what's that going to do to those little bitty eggs? What's it going to do when they, their larvae, their embryo, their juvenile fish, they pop out. They spend the first year for pink salmon in the nursery bays. And here's all this oil washing back and forth. And the herring, four years as little, uh, little juvenile herring in the nursery bays. So the fishermen, we all decided we're going to wait and see. So we're going to wait and see if those little eggs Two years later, they come back as adults. So if they survive, that's number one. And then, pink salmon, if they can produce babies that grow up to be adults, so four years total. Um, and then for the herring, four years before they become adults. So then we'll see them. But meanwhile, you know, they're all little babies. So what happened four years later, 1993? Complete collapse. Complete collapse of the ecosystem, yeah. And we just went, it's long-term harm. And the scientists hadn't done the studies to back that up. So I know this is going to be hard for you all to see, but I just want to, this was a glorious moment. Um, we said, what are we going to do as a community? 
We have to bring national attention to this. Um, Exxon was saying it's not a problem, uh, and we, we thought it was, and the scientists still didn't have any evidence. So we blockaded Valdez Narrows, which is a geologic bottleneck, and we held up oil tanker traffic, which was 25% of the nation's domestic oil, with our fishing boats, 100 fishing boats, every single boat, so nobody could, I mean, it was completely unanimous decision by the SANE fleet. We can pass that around. And that got everybody's attention, okay? And um, the president, finally, it was President Clinton back then, uh, he sent in the uh, uh, Interior Secretary, Bruce Babbitt, to find out what, quote, that bunch of fishermen wanted. That was, that's such a glorious moment, I put it in both books, okay? Um, and the, he was shocked to learn that the bunch of fishermen wanted ecosystem studies because we had the bird biologists and we had the fish biologists and we had the mammal biologists and we had the clam biologists and nobody was talking to anybody. And it was like the ecosystem just collapsed. We want all the pieces put together into one big puzzle so that we'll be able to say, it was too late for our court case, but we'll be able to say oil spills cause long-term harm if we need it in the future, and you guys can use our research now, okay? Because, so, we also asked for no fines for civil disobedience, and we also asked for loan deferment, because our, we have limited entry fishing permits that I was talking about down there, that were $300,000 for salmon saning, for herring saning. So some people own both permits, that's 600 grand, you're in debt. And if you're not, if the fisheries collapse, wh where are you how are you going to make your annual, annual payment? You're not. And then the debt is going to grow on something that you didn't have any part of, right? And so the state of Alaska promised that they would make good and do loan deferment. Well, the federal government came through, and the state did not. And the state did not because when I wrote uh, Sound Truth, I interviewed people. I interviewed over 60 people for that book so that you're actually out there with the fishermen or you're out there with the, the worker who's working on the beaches and getting sick. Um, it's their personal stories. You're out there with the fish biologists. Um, and listen, don't, let's, if there's enough interest in getting this book, we'll figure out a way to get a pallet of them. Kathy, um, Buren, um, I'm, I'm sorry, I just started. Do you want to say something? Yeah, that's just, fine. I should just introduce myself. I'll get back to that book in a second. Okay. okay. We really appreciate Ricky coming. Uh, my name is Catherine Buren. Um, I have sort of become the spokesperson for uh, the commercial fishing industry. It sort of started here in Hernando Beach and now I'm sort of talking for people from Key West to about Panama City. Um, I, I, uh, I'm Ronnie Buren's wife. Um, we have a fish house that's just right here in Hernando Beach. We have six fishing boats. His brother's uh, been a fisherman his whole life. Ronnie's been a fisherman his whole life. He's second generation. I have a 12 year old right there that just ran out and got the book. <laughs> I hate to say it, but I don't believe he'll be a fisherman. Let's hope so. Let's hope. Sorry. Yeah. And um, my heart is in this, and I know that a lot of you aren't fishermen, and that's okay, too. You know, you're not, like, left out of the loop. This is affecting all of us. We are all part of this, and it's this huge mess that's coming in. And, you know, Ricky's a survivor. The first week when this started, she didn't want to talk to anyone. This is something that was painful. This affected people's children. Um, you know, she's warned us, you know, be careful when you're in the midst of trying to fight for this that you do not make the mistake of forgetting about the kids, you know, make sure that you guys don't. Um, Ricky's here because I brought her in. I, I begged her to come. She's so busy trying to help us up there. You know, the oil hasn't come in, but we're all scared. I mean, I think everyone in this room would say we're scared, right? And, um, I felt like it was really necessary. I saw a little tiny video of something she had spoken about about the second week um, of the spill, and I knew when I heard what she had to say that we weren't hearing that anywhere else. So I brought her in for the sole purpose of just helping us, and that's why she's here. She's not here to, to make money off of anybody. The books that she's talking about bringing in pallets, um, the only thing we're required to do is pay for shipping. It's a pallet of books. She can't just pay for shipping, too. They just don't have that kind of money to put out. I don't have that kind of money to put out. <laughs> no. I can give them away because I right. wrote them. But. <laughs> but there's things in there that you're going to read and you, things you're going to hear her say and things you're going to see in that film if you can see.